Welcome back. We are going to now talk about divisors. So divisors are just a neat way to keep track of arithmetic or geometric information about your uh, curves, about maps. Um, when we have, for example, ramification indices, we might want to keep track of all the ramification indices at every point with some sort of object that allows me to do this. And this is what a divisor does. It will keep track of certain information at points in an easy way. So uh, divisors, uh, simply put the divisors on uh, a, a, let's do, C is a curve. And uh, the divisor group on C is the free, Abelian group uh, generated by points on C. So uh, what does that mean? It means that it is elements of this form. It's sums, um, formal sums of integers times uh, points. So the points here is just sort of placeholders. You can think of it also as an infinite vector where there is a coordinate for every point. But of course, there might be, well, it might be, depending on your view, it might be uncountable the number of points. So a vector doesn't make uh, sense in general. Um, so, um, so just take this to be this. Is this a placeholder at P? What integer do we have? And so the, this is some range over points in C, and it is a free abelian group. So we, we can't have infinite sums. So these are integers, and these integers are zero uh, for almost all points in C. Okay. Uh, we define the degree, so this is the divisor group. The degree of a divisor is uh, the sum of the NPs. Okay, now without the placeholders, so now just this is an actual integer. And we also define the, uh, a subgroup, which is the divisors of degree zero. We'll see in a moment why that uh, is actually interesting. So those divisors on the curve uh, such that the degree is zero. Okay. So um, something else to know is that the Galois group acts on divisors. So uh, the Galois group, which is uh, usually denoted by GK, this acts on divisors by acting on the points. Uh, so if sigma uh, is uh, an automorphism of the algebraic closure, then uh, sigma acting on D, you just define it to be uh, the same, except that I let sigma act on P, okay? Here, by the way, this notation, if you haven't seen that before, uh, P sigma is the same if you want a sigma acting on P uh, coordinate wise. Okay, so sigma acting on each coordinate of P sends it to another point, which is also on the curve because the curve is defined over K. And then um, we define the divisors that are defined over K. These are not just divisors that are supported on points that are defined over K. These are divisors that are uh, fixed by Galois. So uh, those are uh, those divisors on the curve such that uh, D sigma is D for all sigma in the absolute Galois group. Remember that, uh, so that is not the same. So this can have a, an effect that, for example, if you have a point that is a square root of two zero and minus a square root of two zero, 
Galois would permute those two points. So it doesn't fix, you know, fix them point-wise, but it permutes that. And as long as you have uh, such a divisor, then that would be fixed by Galois without being um, defined over Q, for example. Okay. Uh, can I just ask real fast? Did we yep. say how NP is defined? NP? No, no. So these are just, uh, this is the group on all such divisors. So right now you can put any NPs in there, any anything you want. But I'm going to start defining some divisors that are coming from the curve that have some meaning. So for example, that, that's a good question. So right now this is just sort of like formal nonsense. And now I'm going to start coming up with divisors that are actually coming from uh, the curve, from information on the curve. So for example, we say that a divisor is a principal, okay, if D is um, the divisor, oops, no, 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 no. Uh, well, yeah, that the divisor I, I should have defined what this means first. Let, so let me get to it. Is a divisor of a function for some function in the function field, some non-zero function on the function field where, so how do I define a divisor of a function? The divisor of a function is defined by the sum over points on the curve. And what are my NPs are going to be the order of vanishing at P of F times my placeholder P, okay? So divisors that are coming from functions like this. So if you take a function, I can take the, the vanishing divisor, basically. This is the divisor of the function, the divisor given by the order of vanishing at each point that gives me a divisor. Why is this well-defined? Remember, Uh, there is only, uh, so if it is a non-zero function, there is only uh, finitely many uh, zeros and poles. So uh, that order is zero for almost all points. And then when there is a, a zero, it might be, a, it will be a positive order. And when there's a pole is a negative integer and that's it, okay? So for example, um, let's, uh, let's write it here. Remember that we had y squared equals x minus e1, x minus e2, x minus e3. Then uh, what is the divisor? of the function x minus e1. Let's see. We said, uh, we computed this previously, that the order of vanishing at uh, p1, so remember uh, here pi is ei comma zero, the order of vanishing there was two, okay? So it's two times p1 and uh, there was a pole at O, so that tells me that is minus two times O, okay? There might be other vanishing for all we know, but actually no, if it's a function X minus E1, the only vanishing zeros will be when X minus E1 is zero, so when X equals E1, when X equals E1, Y equals zero, so that is only P1. So that is only zeros, but how about poles? There is that, that function has no denominator. The only pole can happen at infinity. And we've analyzed that there is a pole at um, infinity. And that's it. Okay, so that is the divisor. And, uh, and note that the degree of this divisor is zero. Okay. Similarly, what is the divisor of y? Um, so y, we saw that it vanished at pi to order one. So it is p1 plus p2 plus p3. 
we saw that it has a pole of order three at O, so it's minus three times O. And again, Y can vanish also only when Y is zero, which gives me P1, P2, or P3, and that's it. And it can have a pole only at O, so that is the only pole, so this is the divisor of Y. And notice also that the degree is also zero. The degree of the divisor of y is also zero. It's one plus one plus one minus three equals zero. Okay. So that's again, this is just a formality. I'm not doing anything other than keeping track of my zeros and poles in a neat way. By saying that the divisor of x minus e1 is 2p1 minus 2o, I'm giving you all the information about zeros and poles of that function. But if you know some complex analysis, you know that knowing the the zeros and the um, the zeros and the poles of one analytic function, it tells you a lot about the analytic function. So um, this is more than what it appears. Uh, it is actually keeping track of a lot of information of your functions. Um, there are going to be there's going to be one such function up to a constant. Uh, so that's x minus u one. Okay. All right, so here's um, principal divisors. So that's the first interesting divisor. There's going to be also something like called the ramification divisor. If you have a function phi, I can actually keep track of all the ramification at all points, and that would give me another interesting divisor. Um, so yeah, I said that, um, so principal divisors, is uh, the subgroup of principal divisors. So divisors of the form divisors of a function. Okay. Uh, we say we, we can do a, an equivalence relation between divisors that D1 and D2 are linearly equivalent. If they differ by a principal divisor, okay, so this means that D1 is D2 plus the divisor of a function for some uh, F in the function field, okay, and then. Uh, the Picard group is uh, defined by this uh, this relationship. So the divisor group divided by uh, principal or modulo principal divisors. Okay, and uh, similarly. You can also talk about Picard group defined over C, uh, which is those elements in the Picard group that are fixed by Galois. All right, and we'll talk about the Picard group uh, a little bit later, how uh, it comes up in the, in the group law of an elliptic curve. Okay, so here is uh, another proposition um, that is important is that if Z is a smooth curve and F is a function, a non-zero function, then uh, first of all, the divisor of F is zero if and only if F is actually a constant. Remember that we already said that such a function uh, has to have some poles. If it doesn't have poles, then it is a constant function. So if the divisor of F is zero, meaning there is no zeros or poles, then it has to be a constant function. And B, if it is not a constant function, still the degree of the divisor of F is zero 
which means that there is as many zeros as there are poles with multiplicity. So there might be, for example, um, remember we just saw that the divisor of y is p1 plus p2 plus p3 minus 3 times o. So um, that's what needs to happen, that it's 1 plus 1 plus 1 minus 3. The degree is 0. There are as many zeros or there are poles in the function. OK? Um, if you think about this in terms of P1, so one of the problems in the, in the homework tells you to think about these things in terms of functions in P1. If you think about functions over the affine line, if you take, for example, uh, the polynomial x squared, then you see that that polynomial has two zeros at x equals zero, and that's it. But then the more zeros you have like that, then also the more degree you have, the higher the vanishing is going to be, or the higher the pole is going to be at infinity. So uh, the function x squared would have two, two zeros at zero, and then two poles, a double pole, at infinity. So anyway, you can think about it in terms of any function over P1 is going to be some rational function, and then you can figure out how many zeros, how many poles are there in total, and what happens in that case. Okay. We are in business here. Um, we already defined um, uh, we also the, uh, had um remember the divisors of degree zero then i can also define the picard group of degree zero um oh i yeah i now i remember why i did not define this before is because um in, to or, in order to do the same kind of quotient like we did here we need to know that the principal divisors are inside the divisors of degree zero. But now, thanks to this proposition, we know that principal divisors are uh, of degree zero. Right? And then we can do a quotient. Um, we can do, uh, we can define uh, Picard zero, okay, of, of the curve is going to be the divisors of degree zero modulo principal divisors. And similarly, uh, Picard zero uh, over K is going to be Picard zero of C, which are fixed by Galois. All righty. Okay, so um, here is another uh, another divisor that is of interest is um, that if you have a map, then actually there is a map which we call also phi star, not to be confused with the other phi star we had before, um, which is divisor of C2 to divisors of C1, a map that sends a point Q or the divisor supported at Q to a ramification divisor, which is over points in the pre-image of Q, which there are only finitely many. I send it and I And then the NPs in this case are ramification indices uh, for phi at P. Again, there's only finitely many pre-images. So this gives you um, a divisor. There's no finite, infinitely many coordinates here. And um, this is called the, the ramification divisor. If you look in the in the book, there is a whole bunch of properties of ramification divisors, and there is another one, uh, another map phi uh, lower star, 
And there's a lot of properties of this satisfy. I'm going to escape all those for the time being. And when I need some of those, I'll just mention that those hold. All right. So now uh, we can start talking about uh, uh, differentials. Which is another abstract nonsense um, construction. So uh, let's just define it and then see what happens. Is one of these quite magical uh, abstract nonsense constructions that um, they don't seem to say anything, and all of a sudden they have actually deep um, deep properties. So we say uh, that the meromorphic differentials. on C, uh, a curve, uh, is the set omega C, um, which is the which is the a vector space over the function field of the curve generated by symbols of the form the x for some x in the function field subject to the following relations, which look like differentials. So I, uh, D of X plus Y equals DX plus DY, but they're linear for all X, uh, Y functions. Uh, two, the product rule, which is that x dy plus y dx and the derivative of a constant is zero. Okay, there you go. Um, all right, so um, what can you say about um, differentials. One second here. Okay. So here's a proposition. Let's see be a curve. Then um, it turns out that um, the dif the differentials is a one dimensional uh, KC vector space and uh, B let X over KC. Uh, then uh, dx is a kc uh, basis if and only if this extension is uh, finite separable. Okay. And um, recall, one second, please. All right, I'm back. So this is um, a basis of the space of uh, differentials. 
even only have uh, the extension uh, the, the function field down to kx is finite several. And recall that um, that we saw that if t is a uniformizer at some uh, smooth point p, then uh, kc over kt is uh, finite separable. So, um, so there we have already uh, basis basis of um, of the spatial differential, which is if you find that you uniformizer, you can use that one dt as a as a basis of your space. So, uh, this, by the way, I think in the book is proposition four point two. Uh, so let me talk about uh, proposition um, uh, four point three and what it tells you about differentials also. So uh, if the P on C, and you have a function field, and you have a uniformizer, at P, um, which I'm going to assume that is a smooth point, just in case, then uh, first of all, uh, for all omega, for any uh, differential, there is a unique function in the function field uh, such that omega is actually g times dt. And uh, by the way, this comes from here, right? This is precisely what I just said, that t is a uniformizer, then t is going to be a basis of the differentials. So if you have any other differential, then I can multiply by some g to get to that differential, OK? Uh, we call, actually, uh, this is now a definition. When you write uh, this, then g, where we're going to write it, we're going to say that is uh, omega over dt. Okay, and this is again notation. I, I can I can't divide over dt, so this is really a notation. When I say omega over dt, is that function g such that dt, which is a basis vector, times g gives me my differential? Okay. B. Uh, if I have f in the function field regular. at p, then uh, df dt, which is again what I just defined to be uh, df dt, so it's a, a function such that the function times dt gives me df, is also regular at p. So again, now these df dt is an honest to goodness function in the function field. So I can check, is it regular? And this is telling me that if f is regular at p, then df dt is regular at p. Great. And uh, c, the order of vanishing, um, which I'm going to define, again, this is a definition here, as the order of vanishing at p of omega over dt, this is well defined. Why am I saying well-defined here? Because you see I'm defining the order at omega of P um, in terms of a uniformizer, but I, I have to choose a uniformizer. So this is all this is saying is it doesn't depend on the choice of my uniformizer. And I'm guessing I'm skipping some parts here that I don't need for the time being. Uh, for almost all P in the curve, the order of vanishing is going to be zero. And that comes from the fact that the order of vanishing at, uh, of a function is zero almost everywhere. Okay. Um, uh, what happened to D? Yeah, I skipped it, I think. <laughs> I, I think if you go back to Silverman, if, I, if you look at it, there must be some, uh, some D that, um, that I just don't want to talk about right now. 
Okay. So there are other parts. Just just so you know, there is more. There's always more content in Silverman's book that I'm that I'm talking about in the lectures. All right. So um, then we define yet one more interesting differential. Uh, the an interesting divisor is the divisor of a differential, which is the sum over points on the curve of the order of vanishing of the differential with the placeholder P for a differential in the space of differentials, okay? And we say that uh, uh, omega is uh, regular or holomorphic Um, if the order of vanishing at uh, p is um, bigger or equal to zero for all p in c, and we say that it is non-vanishing if the order at p is less or equal to zero for all p in c. Okay, now um, you might be wondering how can this be? Or there, if we are defining the order of vanishing of omega as the order of vanishing of a function, shouldn't these always be just? Um, how can you have that the order of vanishing is always positive for all p? Shouldn't it be that the degree of this is zero? So uh, here's a question. Shouldn't it be that the degree of the divisor is zero because it's defined or yes, as a, the order of vanishing of a function. So shouldn't that be zero? And the answer is no. Careful, I'm gonna uh, put some um, markers here, and that is not true because the function changes. With P, right? DT, T is actually a uniformizer at P. So you see that uh, here, when I say this, if you replace it by this definition, this for every P, there is a different T, right? So we might actually just out, out of caution, caution, we have that T is T at P, okay? It's a uniformizer at P. So those functions omega over DT actually change for every P. I have to find a uniformizer and compute the vanishing there. So uh, you have to be careful. Right. So let me, let me actually find uh, one uniformizer for you or one, um, one divisor. Okay, so um, let's take, let's find a, a divisor on P1, okay? And find the, the divisor of the, um, so I'm going to find a, whole, a, a differential on P1 and then find a, the divisor of the, the divisor of the um, differential. So let's work over P1. We know the function field of P1 Okay, that is just um, the function in one variable. X itself I see is a uniformizer at zero, right? So that is going to be my spatial differentials is actually be generated by dx. Okay, so now <clears throat> what I want to compute is the divisor of uh, of omega of dx? Okay, so um, let's see how we do this. We have to do for every first of all, if p is a point in p one, 
and p is x naught y naught. Okay. Um, then what are the uniformizers? So if p is not uh, one zero, then a uniformizer at p is just given by x minus x naught. And then the uh, uniformizer, uh, the dt dp, the you know, dtp is the same that take the differential of x minus x naught, which is the differential of x minus differential of x naught. X naught is a constant, so this is just dx. So dx over dt is one. They're actually the same um, as a differential. I get the same thing. They're not the same function, x and x minus x naught, but the differential is the same. Okay. And um, so what if uh, p is uh, 1, 0? Then I can no longer use x minus, uh, oops. Um, uh, yes, one zero. Then, um, then I can pick my uh, my differential to be uh, one over x. All right, and um, and then what is the differential there? If I take uh, differentials here, then is the differential of one over x? Then I can actually do. Uh, like the quotient rule, and this is minus dx over x is squared, um, and the order of vanishing. So dx over dt, uh, so the order of vanishing uh, of at x equals zero of minus one over x is squared is minus two. Okay, so what happens then is that the, the divisor of dx is going to be uh, the sum over points on p1 of the order of vanishing of p of dx at p which is going to be um, first the order of vanishing um, uh, for p not the point at infinity of of dx at p plus the order of vanishing at infinity. So I might well call it infinity of um, of dx times the point at infinity, and this is. Um, it is, um, so you see that the order of vanishing here is a constant function, so the order of vanishing is zero. So this is zero times p for all these p's uh, plus uh, minus two times one zero. Okay, so uh, the divisor is just minus two times the point at infinity. So it turns out that the degree of the divisor dx is minus two. So it is non zero. Okay. Um, and it has uh, poles, it has a double pole at infinity. Okay. Okay. So going back to um, to divisors, going back to divisors, uh, we define the uh, canonical divisor class on C um, is the class 
So this is what I'm defining as a canonical divisor class. Um, is the class of divisor omega in the Picard group. So uh, this divisor modulo principal divisors for any uh, non-zero differential. On omega c. If you have an omega uh, non-zero differential, um, then any other you, this is going to generate uh, the other. So, um, so it takes it takes care of that. All right. Um, so let me let me do one more example. I think before I finish today, which is compute a couple of differentials, uh, also on an elliptic curve. So here is, um, by the way, this, the, the canonical divisor class um, is usually called KC. It will come back. Um, so take uh, an elliptic curve, y squared equals x minus e1, x minus e2, x minus e3. I'm working here over an algebraic closed field, so might as well factor the polynomial in x. And um, so, the goal here is to compute the divisor of dx. Okay, so if I uh, if I differentiate the equation of the elliptic curve, uh, so you take derivatives, then uh, what I'm going to get is two uh, y dy equals, and then I do the product rule here gives me x minus e one x minus e2 plus x minus e2, x minus e3 plus x minus e1, x minus e3 dx, okay? Which means that I have a, a way to represent dx, which is uh, 2y dy over that sum uh, for i not j of x minus ei, x minus ej, all right? And uh, it turns out that y itself as a uniformizer, at each one of the pi's, remember? Remember that the divisor of y was p1 plus p2 plus p3 minus three times infinity. So it vanishes to order one at p1, p2, and p3. So it's a uniformizer. So I can use that in the definition of uh, the divisor because I, I need to now, um, I need to write dx as a, a uniformizer times a function and then evaluate the function at p1. So um, what this tells me then is that the order of vanishing uh, at each one of these pi's of dx um, by the definition is the order at pi of this function that is multiplying dy, so 2y over the sum of x minus ei, x minus ej, and then uh, the vanishing at pi again, um, the the bottom actually does not vanish because it's the sum, one of the terms will vanish where there is an ei, um, but not the other term. So this actually, the bottom doesn't vanish. The top vanishes to order one because it's a function of y. So the order of vanishing is one here. Okay. Uh, so now we need to find a uniformizer at infinity so did we find the uniformizer to infinity? Not quite yet, but we know that x, um, y vanishes to order three, not vanishes, it has a pole of order three, x has a pole of order two, so x over y actually is a uniformizer at infinity. Okay, because of the poles. Um, and then uh, when I, do the differential of x over y. I can do the, the quotient rule. 
like that, uh, which tells me then that I have another expression for dx in terms of a uniformizer, which is 2y cubed over uh, 2y squared minus x times the sum, x minus ei, x minus ej, times the differential of a uniformizer. And the order of vanishing now at infinity, y vanishes, not vanishes, it has a pole of order 3. So now the order of vanishing of dx at infinity will be, by this formula, will be the vanishing of this function. And it has a pole on top of order 3 cubed. So it's a pole of order 9. And at the bottom, y has a pole. X has poles. But uh, the pole at y wins because it's of order 3 a square is of order 6, a pole of order 6 at the bottom. So at the bottom, there is a pole of order 6, which in total gives me a minus 3. OK, so then um, the divisor, let's write it here. We've computed everything that can happen, and the divisor of dx as P1 plus P2 plus P3 uh, minus 3, uh, oops, minus 3 O. Okay. Um, so, do you remember that divisor looks familiar? It's precisely the divisor of Y, right? So uh, this is nice because then the divisor of uh, dx over y will be zero. Okay, so um, that's fantastic because then this tells me, remember, a divisor that only has zeros is a non-vanishing. And if it has no poles, it's holomorphic. So a divisor is exactly zero is a non-vanishing holomorphic differential. Okay, so we say that dxy is a non-vanishing holomorphic differential um, for uh, the elliptic curve. And this will be very useful later. All right, so I'm um, going to stop here. And next time, finally, we will present the Riemann-Roch theorem and we'll actually use it uh, for good to find a via stress form for elliptic curves. And then we'll actually start doing elliptic curves um, and not so much algebraic geometry. So I'll stop here.